Hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, my name is Megan Jabori. I am our lead course instructor and tutor here at JD Advising, and we are super excited uh, to welcome all of you ABA members to the MPRE office hours. What our plan is for today is to talk about some frequently asked questions relating to the MPRE, uh, give you some tips for some last minute preparation, and then cover some highly tested rules by going over some questions. And we'll also talk about the best way to approach questions as well. So I think you'll get a lot out of our time together today. Administratively, if you check out the chat box, you'll be able to access and uh, download the document that uh, we'll essentially be following along with today. We have a PowerPoint slide that I'll be sharing, but the document you have access to in the chat box uh, mimics that PowerPoint. So I think you'll find it helpful. And if you don't already have it handy or have it uh, access to it, please feel free to download it. Um, otherwise, you are welcome to ask questions throughout our time together. I just ask that you use the Q&A function here on Zoom. We have some panelists with us today that are uh, going to help answer questions while I'm speaking. And if you guys have a lot of questions, that's totally fine. We're happy to stay after the presentation and answer those as well. Um, I just ask that you be patient with us if there are a lot of questions, because sometimes it takes a moment to answer them. So I promise we'll get to your question. Uh, just sit tight and be patient. And like I said, I promise we'll answer them, even if it just takes a moment. Okay, so what I want to do here is share that PowerPoint. So let me get it going. Okay, and again, I encourage you to follow along in your handout if you want, or just download that handout and keep it handy. So as I mentioned, we'd spend our first few minutes discussing kind of some frequently asked questions about the MPRE. We find that the MPRE is an exam that law students know they have to take. They understand they have to pass it. So oftentimes they find themselves signed up for this exam and they don't know some of the basics. And that is obviously an impediment to preparation and, of course, studying effectively so that you can pass. So these frequently asked questions we've compiled from years of people contacting us, asking us questions about the MPRE. Um, so maybe this will answer some of the questions that you have. And if not, it might just reinforce some information you already know, which doesn't hurt to make sure that you're on track and you really fully understand what the exam expects. So the first frequently asked question we get is what does this exam actually test? You know you have to take the MPRE, but what are you supposed to be studying specifically? So this statement comes from the National Conference of Bar Examiners, the people who write and administer the MPRE exam. And they tell us that the MPRE is based on the governing law and conduct, I'm sorry, the, uh, the law governing the conduct and discipline of lawyers and judges, including the disciplinary rules of professional conduct, articulated in the ABA model rules of professional conduct, as well as the ABA model rules for judicial conduct. In other words, you are responsible for knowing these judicial rules as well. But further, it also tests the controlling constitutional decisions and generally accepted principles established in our leading federal and state cases and in procedural and evidentiary rules. Oftentimes, this statement strikes people as interesting. I've worked with a ton of students one on one who did not know this information. They didn't know that they were responsible for knowing uh, the rules regarding judicial conduct, or they didn't know that it, there was a potential to receive questions on those controlling constitutional decisions, for instance. So again, these are all things you want to have on your radar as you continue to prep for this exam coming up. Uh, the big takeaway from this, in case you haven't picked up already, is that this exam, the NPRE, is not going to test your local jurisdiction's rules. So, you know, if you're in Michigan, for instance, it's not going to necessarily help you to study and memorize the Michigan rules. Instead, you should be focusing on these ABA model rules. Our next frequently asked question is how many questions are actually administered for this exam and how many are actually scored? And this is a great question because this should impact how you study and how you score yourself with these practice or simulated exams. 
So the MPRE consists of 60 multiple choice questions, but only 50 of the 60 are scored. So again, this is helpful because if you took a simulated exam, you can score, say, 50 of the 60 uh, to get a good feel for how you're doing and where you're scoring. This exam is administered over two hours. Um, this is assuming that you do not have any sort of extensions or accommodations. Um, I, to give you guys a quick tip, because there are 10 experimental questions, um, we recommend you answer every single question as best as you can. Even if you think uh, you are encountering an experimental question, I still recommend you just answer it. Oftentimes, trying to discern which is a scored question versus which is an experimental question is very challenging. So it's always best case scenario for you to just answer every question. So turning to the question about how this exam is scored, and this might be the most frequently asked question. Uh, we get lots of questions on scoring, so hopefully you find this information helpful. But generally speaking, this exam is scaled from the score of 50 to 150. The other thing to keep in mind about what is considered passing is that there is no uniform number. Um, hence why I think there are so many questions on this topic. Uh, here you can see our chart on the slideshow um, illustrates the jurisdictions and what they consider the passing score to be. And of course, as you can see, what is considered passing is going to vary depending on which jurisdiction you're in. So if you have any questions about what you personally need to score to pass, I suggest you just you, you contact your local jurisdiction or you visit your board of law examiners website, maybe check in with someone at your school uh, just to double check um, that information for your jurisdiction. Um, as you can see, the states tend to range from about the score of a 75 all the way up to an 86, uh, which is a pretty, pretty big range. So I mentioned that you are hopefully taking some practice tests or simulated exams, and you might be trying to score yourself to see where you are at in terms of your performance and if you're performing well enough to pass. So oftentimes people ask us if they do take a practice test, how many questions should they be shooting to get correct to get that passing score ultimately. And here we have this really nice chart uh, that again speaks to most jurisdictions. So to just walk through some of this, if you are taking a 50 question exam, uh, you wanna shoot to get about 34 of those 50 questions correct, that would translate to the score of a 100, which means generally you would have passed this exam for every jurisdiction. To jump down to kind of the middle rows here, if you're in one of those kind of middle jurisdictions that requires somewhere between an 80 to an 85, which is the vast majority of jurisdictions, if you think back to that chart, here, if you were to take a 50 question practice exam, you need between 29 and 30 questions correct out of 50. Or if you were to take a 60 question practice exam, 35 to 36 questions out of those 60, you would need to get correct. And then finally, if you needed the score of a 75, you can see that this just continues to decrease. If you took a 50 question exam, you would need 28 of the 50 questions correct or 34 out of 60, about a 56%. So again, this information is really helpful because remember our exam is scaled on that um, is is scaled from fifty to one hundred and fifty. That doesn't mean you need uh, the percentage of a fifty or a sixty to pass necessarily, right? Because you can see the raw percentages are broken down here on the chart, and then how the scores on that fifty to one hundred and fifty point scale work. In other words, a sixty eight percent if you were to do just your raw percentage, would translate to about the score of a 100 on that scale of 50 to 150. I mentioned that I wanted to provide you with some last minute prep tips because obviously this exam is around the corner and uh, everyone is likely in a different place with their studying. Some people have started a few weeks ago. Some people are kind of studying at the last minute. But nonetheless, no matter where you are at in your kind of study plan, I think this these tips will be very helpful for you. This is my favorite tip. And this is information that I think is super helpful and that not all people preparing for this exam know, unfortunately. Um, and I believe it should really impact how you study. So what this tip is, is you should study smart. But what that really means is you should get a feel for how the topics uh, within the ABA model rules of professional conduct are tested. 
the National Conference of Bar Examiners tell us uh, how frequently these topics appear on your exam. And again, this is helpful because if you're struggling with a certain subsection or a certain topic of these rules, knowing how frequently or infrequently it's going to appear on your exam should impact how you move forward with that material. Um, so some of these topics are very heavily tested. They're going to make up a large portion of your exam. And then other topics here or other subsections of the rules make up a very small amount or minimal amount of your exam. And to be clear, I would never recommend that you skip over preparing any subsection or topic of the rules, but I do think you should study smart. And since uh, people are busy and there's a lot of other things going on in your life, you might not have as much time as you want to study. So knowing this information can help guide you with the time that you have left in your preparation. So I just want to point a few things out here. So for instance, conflicts of interest, this fourth bullet here on the left, is the most highly tested subsection or topic of the rules. The examiners tell us that this topic alone, conflicts of interest, makes up 12 to 18% of your total exam. So if you were studying at the last minute and you didn't have a lot of time to go over things super thoroughly, start here. Make sure you have conflicts of interest rules memorized because you're going to get a lot of bang for your buck, so to speak, right? Uh, because these rules are going to appear the most frequently on your exam. Similarly, the lawyer-client relationship uh, is pretty heavily tested. It's kind of like in third place. That makes up 10 to 12% of your total exam. Look at the last bullet here on the left-hand side, litigation and other forms of advocacy. This is the second most highly tested topic of the rules, uh, making up 10 to 16% of your exam. Um, so again, this information just helped guide you or should help guide you with your time moving forward and uh, the rules. Our other tip for you in preparation of the exam is that you should try your very best to get your hands on real questions when you study. Uh, the National Conference of Bar Examiners has released MPRE questions, in other words, questions that have been used as part of the MPRE before. Um, and now they are releasing them to the public to use in preparation of the exam. Uh, you can purchase these questions from the examiners. Uh, you could get the questions from people like us. We have them here at JD Advising. Uh, but nonetheless, wherever, wherever you choose to get them from, I do recommend that you use some real or released questions in your preparation. There is nothing wrong with simulated or invented questions. Those are very helpful. Many bar prep companies out there make those questions widely available to their um, customers or to their students. And again, those are great to practice with. It just shouldn't be your only resource to practice with. So keep that in mind. Another study tip is to take a simulated exam. Um, Oftentimes, people don't know if they struggle with timing uh, because they don't frequently take timed exams, so it's a hard thing to understand. So we recommend that sometime prior to you taking the exam that you try to simulate your exam experience as best as possible. This way, you can get a real feel for what the expectation is and if you can complete the exam within the amount of time that you have. Uh, because obviously, it's a challenge if you study a lot and you know these rules, but you can't answer the questions questions within the time constraints. That's going to be very challenging for you to pass. So you need to make sure that you are on time. The other thing to keep in mind is that the MPRE is administered on the computer. This is not a pen paper exam. So if you are going to set aside time to take a simulated exam, we recommend that you practice taking a test on your computer. This way, again, you're trying to simulate the exam experience as much as you possibly can. I think you'll benefit from that greatly. Another tip, and you can do this you know, now, in fact, I recommend you do this now in preparation for the exam, but it's also something you can do on exam day, is you should get in the habit when you approach a question to read the question and to pause and ask yourself, what rule is this testing? If you can force yourself to articulate the rule that's being tested before you dive into your answer choices, you are way less likely to make a silly mistake. You are way less likely to fall into a trap of a tricky answer choice. The MPRE, in my opinion, is a very challenging exam. And I'm not saying that to scare you or anything like that. I'm just saying that to be honest. This exam is tough. It's written in tricky ways. There are tricky answer choices. And one of the best ways to avoid making a silly mistake or falling into a trap answer is to force yourself to think through what is being tested, try to articulate the rule, 
apply the rule to the facts, and try to reach an answer choice all on your own before you turn to those answer choices. And we're going to utilize that approach together when we try our three practice questions today. So you can see what I'm talking about in practice. And then our uh, next tip is on exam day, or again, while you're practicing here between now and your exam rolling around, you should do your best to eliminate answer choices that contradict the facts. Again, this is a tricky exam. I just got done saying that. The people who write this exam uh, do not necessarily make it easy. But one thing you can get in the habit of doing is if you're evaluating answer choices, try to see if any of the answer choices actually contradict the facts. Many times they do. And this can be really helpful because sometimes two answer choices look really similar and people struggle trying to figure out which is the best answer. And oftentimes one of those similar looking answer choices to another is wrong because it simply contradicts the facts, sometimes in a minor way, but nonetheless, it's a contradiction and you can confidently eliminate it uh, if you're looking for this, which I think is a really, really helpful tip. Um, uh, one of our final study tips for you, and maybe you're already doing this, is that you should make a mini attack outline from your big outline. Um, some people really benefit from making their own, like truly going through an outline and putting together their own mini outline or attack outline, whatever you like to call it, because sometimes going through that, the motions and thinking through the rules and creating the outline itself is a really great active review strategy to make sure you have these rules memorized. Um, if you don't want to make your own, you know, cheat sheet or attack outline, we have one in our outline. So you could always use that as a resource for an alternative. Okay, so now we've talked about some of those frequently asked questions about the NPRE. Um, again, you might have known some of that information. If so, great. If not, hopefully you're better armed with information to help you move forward more effectively with, you, with the time that you have left between the present and your exam. We've also now covered some tips uh, for the remaining time that you have left to study. And what we have left on our agenda together today is I want to do some practice questions with you. And really the whole point of this is kind of twofold. We have picked some questions. These are invented questions, by the way. So these are not released. These are questions that we've made up that illustrate highly tested topics and rules. And again, this is helpful because if you're really familiar with those highly tested topics and highly tested rules, you're more likely to pass and do well on this exam. Because as we've learned, certain topics are more frequently tested than others. So that's one reason we're going to do these questions together, to give you a little taste of that. The second reason we're going to do these questions is I want to illustrate to you that approach that we recommend you utilize in answering questions. And again, you can do this moving forward in the time that you have left to study, and you can even utilize it on exam day if you find it helpful, which many people do. So the way I'm going to approach these questions is I'm going to read the question, the facts, I'm going to read the call of the question, and we're going to stop. And the whole point of stopping there is for us to be able to talk about what rule is being tested and articulating that rule. And then we will try to apply that rule to the facts. Again, we're doing all of this in an effort to reach a conclusion on our own. Then once we've reached a conclusion on our own, we can turn to those answer choices and try to evaluate them and figure out which one best matches what we just said. And again, this is really helpful because it will show you how well or not well, you know these rules. And it's a great way then for you to uh, figure out what, what parts of your outline you need to go back and revisit and better memorize. If you do not have the rules memorized, this approach is very challenging. Um, or if you have some of the rules memorized and not others, again, this is helpful to kind of point you in the direction of where you have some gaps that you need to fill. Okay, so let's tackle question one together using that approach that I just outlined. So the facts tell us a new attorney is writing her first appellate brief in the appellate court for state A. Her research reveals that the legal question involved is one of first impression in state A, but that the appellate court in state B has decided the exact legal point in a manner adverse to the attorney's client. Must the attorney address the state B case law in her appellate brief? Okay, so stopping there, as I said, you know, what subsection or portion of the rules is this question testing? Well, this is testing litigation and other forms of advocacy. And if you think back to a few slides ago, this makes up, meaning this section makes up 10 to 16% of your total exam. 
This is the second most highly tested subsection of the rules. So it's a, a very important part of the rules to be familiar with as you're preparing. So now that we know that, let's try to narrow it down even more. What rule is being tested here? And I would say the rule that's being tested is, um, and again, I'm just going to generally articulate it and then I'll get more specific. But based on these facts, the rule that's being tested is whether or not a lawyer has to reveal uh, law that is adverse to her client's position. And we have rules that speak directly to this issue. And the rules are very specific. They tell us that a lawyer is uh, prohibited from failing to disclose to the court legal authority that they, uh, in the controlling jurisdiction, known to be directly adverse to the lawyer's client. And what I would like to stress in that rule is the words controlling jurisdiction. So in other words, if you are a practicing lawyer and you're representing a client in front of a tribunal or a court, and you know there is controlling authority that hurts your client's position, and opposing counsel for whatever reason, has not disclosed that authority to the court, it is your obligation to make sure the court knows that authority exists. In other words, you kind of have to do opposing counsel's job if opposing counsel is not doing it themselves for whatever reason. Now, as I previously mentioned, this doesn't mean a lawyer has to disclose all authority from every jurisdiction that's adverse to their client. No, that doesn't make a lot of sense. Instead, they're simply obligated to disclose uh, information from their controlling jurisdiction. So knowing that, let's go back and reflect on our facts for a second to see what this lawyer is supposed to do under the facts if this lawyer uh, has to address case law from state B. So we're told that this lawyer is practicing in state A in an appellate court, apparently. And this information in which she's presenting or the question or issue that's being presented to the court is of first impression in her state, state A. But it's something that's been handled in state B and it didn't work out really well, uh, at least for her client or someone in her client's like position. But the key there is they're telling you that that information comes from state B. We're in state A in our fact pattern. And the rule here says that lawyers need to, you know, disclose information from their controlling jurisdiction. Meaning if this authority came from state A, then yes, this lawyer would be bound to disclose that information. They would have that ethical responsibility to do so. But here, because this information is coming from state B, the rule does not require the attorney to disclose this information to the court. So I always like to revisit the call of the question just to make sure I'm best or well positioned to actually find a good answer choice. So again, to repeat the call of the question, it says, must the attorney address the state B case law in her appellate brief? And based on what we just said, the answer is going to be no, because this information is coming from a state B, she's in state A, which means this case law is persuasive. It is not controlling. So knowing that, let's evaluate our answer choices. So it looks like we have two no options, C and D. Answer choice C says no, because the case law is merely persuasive, not controlling. Answer choice C is excellent. It uh, illustrates the rule that we have to disclose controlling authority, but not persuasive. And it's exactly what we were looking for in our analysis of the facts. So C is the correct answer. I always recommend, uh, even if you have found what you think is the correct answer, that you go through those remaining answer choices to double check that they're wrong. This is a really important thing to do in practice. I know that this is sometimes challenging to do on exam day, especially if you're crunched for time. But if you can, I highly recommend it. It's the best way to avoid making a, like a silly mistake. So that's what we'll do together. We'll evaluate these remaining choices. So we know that answer choice C is correct. Let's take it from the top and start with the, our evaluation of A and then B and then D. So A says, yes, because the attorney has a duty to disclose any case law that she knows of that addresses the same legal issue. And answer choice A is wrong for a few reasons. First of all, we were looking for a no answer. We decided that no, this attorney did not have an obligation to disclose this information. But answer choice A is also wrong because that's not what the rule says. Remember, the rule says that the lawyer only has to disclose case law from their controlling jurisdiction. So A misses that point, A is wrong. B says, yes, 
unless opposing counsel consents to allow the attorney to exclude the B case law. So B is just kind of out there. The attorneys do not have the ability to just consent to not present relevant controlling information to the court. Uh, so B is wrong. Um, if it was controlling, it has to be disclosed. I don't know how else to say that. And then finally, answer choice D says no, because it is a question of first impression in state A. Well, D is wrong, because while this may be true, this is an issue of first impression based on what the facts are telling us, that's not really relevant under our analysis of the rule, right? The rule says that the lawyer has to disclose controlling authority if it's adverse to her client and not being disclosed by opposing counsel. Uh, whether or not it's something of first impression is just really not relevant. So that makes answer choice C the best answer to this question. We'll handle question two the same way, meaning I'm gonna read the facts, the call the question, and then we'll stop and we will figure out what the rule is that's being tested and we'll apply it to the facts together. So question two says, after being injured in an automobile accident, a woman met with an attorney to discuss the possibility of filing a lawsuit against the other driver. The woman revealed that she had two alcoholic beverages at dinner prior to getting into the accident. Following the initial meeting, the attorney informed the woman that she did not think the woman had a viable claim and declined to represent the woman. Subsequently, the other driver in the automobile accident visited the same attorney and inquired about obtaining representation to bring a lawsuit against the woman. May the attorney represent the other driver in a lawsuit against the woman. Okay. So stopping there, as we said we would, this question is testing a rule from conflicts of interest. And remember, conflicts of interest as like a topic or subsection is the most highly tested topic under the rules. It makes up 12 to 18 percent of your total exam. So again, if you're crunched on time or you don't know these rules well, they are definitely something you want to spend some time with before your exam rolls around. Okay, so we know that this is a conflicts of interest question, but more specifically, what rule is this question testing? Well, this rule that is being tested here says that a lawyer cannot represent a client with interests materially adverse to those of a prospective client in the same or substantially related matter if the lawyer received information from that prospective client that could be significantly harmful to them in that matter. So let's stop there. There are some exceptions to the rule, but I want to stop there for a second. So remember who a prospective client is for a moment. This is someone who comes to a lawyer, consults with the lawyer, and then ultimately doesn't move forward with representation for whatever reason. Whether they choose not to hire the lawyer or the lawyer chooses to not move forward with that client, it doesn't matter. They're considered a prospective client. And the whole point of having a conflict of interest rule regarding prospective clients is because there are many situations where a prospective client comes to a lawyer, gives them very sensitive or confidential information that would harm them. And the problem is then the lawyer is left with this information and they don't move forward with the representation for some reason. And we need to make sure that that lawyer or the law firm generally cannot use that information to that prospective client's detriment, right? We don't want them to be able to reveal that information in a way that would be harmful to that prospective client, because then it would be very dangerous for people or prospective clients to be able to consult with lawyers, because they'd have to be very, very careful about what they shared with those lawyers. So that's kind of the whole policy behind this. And here we have precisely a prospective client issue because a woman consulted with the lawyer, gave him information, gave him particularly sensitive information because she admitted to drinking before getting behind the wheel of a car and then an accident you know, resulted. But uh, because the lawyer did not want to move forward with that woman, she's a prospective client. And then, of course, the person, other person involved in the accident approaches the lawyer and wants to hire them. So again, to remind you about what this rule says is the lawyer cannot move forward with this other driver uh, and use any information that they might have about this prospective client to potentially harm this prospective client. And again, we know they have harmful information because they have you know, an admission of this woman drinking before driving. I did mention that there are some exceptions to this rule, so I want to just cover that quickly. Oftentimes, uh, questions that test the conflict of interest rules are testing the exceptions, so they are a good thing for you to review and, of course, have on your radar. 
So the exceptions to this rule is, you know, you must remember that generally when one lawyer is disqualified from a case, it disqualifies the whole law firm. These rules treat lawyers in a law firm like one person. So if this per, if this lawyer who met with the prospective client is disqualified, that means generally the whole firm is disqualified. So that's kind of the first basic rule you have to remind yourself of. So if this law firm wants to get around this prospective client conflict, what can they do? Well, one way they could get around the rule or move forward with representation of this other driver is to get consent from both clients or both affected people in writing. In other words, based on our facts, this law firm would have to get consent from the woman and the other driver to move forward with this conflict. And that consent would, again, have to be in writing. The other way around this rule is that the lawyer who is meeting with the prospective client or having this consultation has to make or take reasonable steps to avoid learning um, about as much disqualifying information as possible. So here, if we want to see if any of those exceptions apply, that's not a bad idea, because as I mentioned, that's oftentimes what's being tested. So I do not see any facts that support uh, parties consenting to this conflict of interest, right? We do not have any facts that say the woman consents in writing or that this driver consents in writing to the conflict, meaning one of the exceptions just simply doesn't apply. The other exception uh, to remind you is that the lawyer took steps to avoid learning as much disqualifying information as possible. And again, I don't have any facts that support that type of analysis. The facts tell us that a lawyer met with the woman, they had a consultation, but it doesn't discuss anything about the lawyer doing anything in particular to avoid um, you know, learning more information than necessary. Meaning, because the exceptions don't apply, the attorney is not going to be able to represent the other driver that was involved in this accident. So as I did before, I think it is helpful to always readdress the call the question, uh, may the attorney represent the other driver in a lawsuit against the woman? And we've discussed the answer is no, because of this perspective uh, client conflict rule, right? So we're going to be looking for a no answer. We have two no answers. If you quickly scan them, that would be answer choices A and B. So we can just start there. Answer choice A says no. If the attorney learned information from the woman that would be significantly harmful to her in the lawsuit brought by the other driver. So let's stop there. I like answer choice A for a few reasons. It's a no answer, which is what we were looking for. The other reason I think answer choice A is, is nice is it, that it speaks to the rule. It talks about significantly harmful information being shared from this prospective client to the lawyer. And again, we know that that's the case, at least from a common sense perspective, because this woman admitted to drinking before driving. So I like answer choice A. I think it's correct, but let's look at answer choice B. It says, no, but one of the attorney's partners could represent the other driver. So answer choice B is wrong which is why we went over the exceptions to the rule, right? I said, oftentimes these questions are testing the exceptions. Here, there are two exceptions, but we learned that neither are applicable. So answer choice B is not correct, making A the best answer. But we're not done yet. As we've learned, we always wanna double check those remaining choices, meaning C and D. So C says yes, because the attorney declined to represent the woman. Answer choice C is wrong because whether or not this lawyer was the one who chose to decline the woman or whether the prospective client was the one who chose to not move forward with the lawyer doesn't matter, right? We went over the rule and the rule doesn't at all care about why the parties did not move forward with the representation. Uh, that's basically irrelevant under the rule. What matters is that there's harmful information that was shared that could be used against the prospective client. So C is wrong. D says, yes, if the other driver alone consents to waive the conflict in writing. And as we've learned, there are exceptions to this prospective client conflict and getting consent in writing is a way around the rule, but it requires all of the affected parties or both of the affected parties to give consent. And answer choice D misses that, right? It's not just the driver who has to consent, the woman would have to consent as well. So D is wrong, making answer choice A the best answer here. And then our third and final question, handling it in the exact same way we did before. It says, an attorney was retained to defend a client charged with an isolated incident of child abuse. The client's children are the alleged victims. 
During a private conversation at the attorney's office, the client revealed that he did, in fact, commit the charged acts and that he planned on seeking treatment. The client subsequently discharged the attorney. The attorney has learned that the children will not testify, and consequently, the prosecutor has offered a plea to a reduced charge. The plea offer is pending. The attorney would like to disclose the confession to the prosecutor so that the prosecutor revokes the plea offer. Which of the following best describes the attorney's ability to disclose the client's confession? Okay, so stopping there, this question is testing lawyers' duties of confidentiality. Um, our, our duty of confidentiality as lawyers makes up 6 to 12 percent of our total exam. In other words, that subsection or topic um, is relatively highly tested. I believe it's tied at fourth place. More specifically, this question is testing the duty of confidentiality. And I think the key takeaway from this rule, you know, generally speaking, outside of the context of this question, is you should memorize the rule and then memorize the seven exceptions. Um, as I mentioned before, these questions love to test exceptions. Uh, the duty of confidentiality is no exception, no pun intended. Uh, so oftentimes it's one of the exceptions that is being tested. So let's talk about what the rule says. It says that a lawyer is prohibited from revealing information relating to the representation of the, of the client unless an exception applies. And as I mentioned, there are seven. So let's talk about those seven exceptions quickly. The first is that a lawyer may, by the way, may is applicable to all seven of these exceptions, meaning a lawyer does not have to reveal confidential information, but they can if they want to. So the first exception or the first instance in which they can reveal confidential information is to prevent reasonably certain death or bodily harm. I want to stop there. That looks to me pretty tempting in terms of an answer choice, meaning the lawyer's ability to reveal this information based on our facts, but it is not correct. And the reason I want to stress that that is not correct is because of the plain language of the rule. The rule tells us that a lawyer can reveal may reveal confidential information to prevent reasonably certain death or bodily harm. So the whole point of the exception is that if the lawyer has information and the revealing of that information could prevent someone from dying or getting hurt, then the rules allow the lawyer to reveal it. Here, based on our facts, we do not have any facts that support there is going to be another incident of child abuse. In fact, the facts go out of their way to literally use the words isolated incident. So because we do not have any facts to support that this person will do it again and that there's therefore this information would prevent it from happening again, it's not applicable. The second exception that allows uh, an attorney to reveal confidential information is if the lawyer's services were used for a crime or fraud. Oftentimes, this is a way for a lawyer to kind of clear the air if they were inv involved in some sort of crime or fraud that their uh, client has kind of engaged in, and maybe they unknowingly were involved, this is a good way for them to reveal information so that they can clarify that they were not um, intentionally involved. That doesn't apply here because I don't have any facts that support uh, the lawyer being involved with the client's crime or fraud. The third exception is to prevent or mitigate or rectify substantial injury to the property or financial interests of another that has resulted or is reasonably certain to result from a client's crime or fraud in furtherance of which the client has used the lawyer's services. And much like the previous exception, I don't have any facts here that support that the client in question is uh, going to be committing some sort of crime regarding someone's finances or property and or that they've used the lawyer's services to do that, meaning that exception is simply not applicable. Moving on to our fourth exception is that a lawyer can reveal confidential information to comply with these rules. Um, here, I do not have any facts that support the lawyer has an ethical dilemma. Here, the facts seem to just present a situation where the lawyer has information and wants to share the information, not that they feel this need to share information to clear the air or to try to figure out an ethical dilemma. So that exception is not applicable. The fifth exception is that a lawyer can reveal information uh, if there is some sort of controversy between the lawyer and the client. This usually happens when a lawyer is done representing the client. Uh, oftentimes, 
uh, the client doesn't pay the lawyer and they need to be able to reveal some confidential information in an effort to be able to collect their fee. Um, here again, I don't really have facts that support that situation, so that exception is not applicable. The sixth exception is that lawyers can reveal confidential information to comply with a court order. This is usually a situation where um, you know, there's some litigation and one party wants information from a lawyer's client, the lawyer is attempting to protect that information in a court rules against the lawyer and tells the lawyer that they must reveal the information. In that instance, after consulting with the client, the lawyer is allowed to reveal it. Here again, I don't have any facts that support this. Uh, we just have a situation where, again, the lawyer has been discharged by the client and they have information about the client that they want to share with the prosecutor, and it's going to be harmful to that former client. And then the seventh exception is uh, they can reveal confidential information to try to detect and resolve conflicts of interest. This is very common when lawyers switch law firms and the law firm is trying to figure out if there are any sort of cases or matters in which the lawyer should not be able to participate on. This is also common when law firms say merge um, or parts of law firms merge and join other firms. We definitely have to do conflict of interest checks to make sure that you know, lawyers are handling appropriate matters. Here, I do not see that as being applicable to our facts. So that means I do not have any reason or ethical reason that would allow this lawyer to disclose the client's confession, meaning I don't think this lawyer can disclose this information. So revisiting to call the question, it says, which of the following best describes the attorney's ability to disclose the client's confession? So I'm going to be looking for an answer choice that says something along the lines that the attorney cannot reveal this information because they are bound by this duty of confidentiality. So taking it from the top, A says the attorney may not reveal the confession because he's bound by the duty of confidentiality. So A is perfect. It's exactly what we were looking for. I think it is the right answer, but let's double check our remaining choices. B says the attorney may not reveal the confession because his representation was terminated by the client and therefore the attorney may no longer act in the case. Uh, so B is wrong. To me, it's kind of saying that because the lawyer was fired, they can't do anything. To me, it almost is saying like these exceptions of confidentiality don't exist. And further, it's almost kind of saying like our duty of confidentiality doesn't exist, um, which is of course all wrong. We do have a duty and there are exceptions to it. So I think B is just kind of irrelevant. It misses the point. It doesn't matter who terminated the relationship. C says the attorney may reveal the confession to prevent reasonably certain death or serious bodily harm. So we addressed this earlier when we discussed the seven exceptions. So C is wrong because the whole point of revealing a confidential piece of information is to prevent reasonably certain death or bodily harm. And again, the facts just do not present us with this situation where there is going to be another dangerous situation for these kids, and therefore it's simply not applicable. And then D says the attorney may reveal the confession because the representation has been terminated. To me, answer choice D is a lot like B. It's really focusing on the termination of their relationship, which is simply wrong. The rule specifically tells us that our duty of confidentiality survives the relationship, meaning you no longer have to be employed by your client as their lawyer, and you're still bound by the duty of confidentiality. So knowing that, I think A is the best answer. Okay, so now we've covered some background information on the MPRE. We've talked about some last minute study tips. We've covered some highly tested sections of the rules and highly tested rules themselves. And we've shown you a really good approach that you can utilize in your preparation moving forward and even on exam day, if you find it helpful and you have the ability to do that. Um, so that, for the most part, wraps up what we have planned for our webinar. Now, before we part ways, though, I do want to make sure you understand some of the resources that we have available uh, for our ABA members in your preparation for this exam, and of course, resources that are available in your law school career and maybe bar exam journey in the near future. So on that note, I want to introduce Rosie, who is our lead account uh, executive here, so that she can tell you a little bit more about this. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you, Megan, for the introduction. As Megan said, my name is Rosie, and I am the lead account executive at JD Advising. Chances are, if you ever call us or email us, you'll most likely be speaking with me. 
Um, I just wanted to make you guys aware really quickly of some highly sought after resources that we offer, one of them being our MPRE course. I posted the link to it in the chat box, should you be interested. It's a really, really great course. We get thousands of five-star reviews on it every year. Um, it comes with an MPRE outline, questions, quizzes, just a lot of really helpful resources. Um, we also offer MPRE tutoring should you find yourself uh, having a need for some personalized help. We also offer law school tutoring um, if that is something you've been thinking about, or if you're just not sure what resources are would be of the most help to you or where to start. Um, feel free to give us a call anytime. You can book a call on our website at a time that works best for you, and I'd be more than happy to give you a call and help answer any and all questions you have. I wish you the best of luck on the MPRE and um, don't hesitate to reach out. Back to you, Megan. Thank you, Rosie. We super appreciate that. So thank you guys for attending today. Again, I hope you found this helpful in your preparation for your upcoming exam. Um, we are going to stick around. I see the Q&A is lit up a little bit. So there are some remaining questions. So as I said at the beginning of our time, we are happy to stick around and answer questions if those remain. Um, so to do so, we're just going to turn off our cameras and mics and um, tackle the Q&As. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate. And if you need anything in the future or in your preparation of this exam, please feel free to reach out. Uh, we're happy to help you however we can. Thank you so much again for being here today.